So we're bang on two o'clock and we can begin. So first of all, I'm sure I spoke to quite a lot of you on the phone previously, but um, I'm James and I am the business development manager at Copters. So I solely um, work with construction and survey businesses and I help introduce, support and get people involved with using drones as this, um, this means of collecting data fast and efficiently. So I, I studied surveying and mapping at Newcastle University, and this is where I first came in contact with drones. There's in a final year dissertation, and we used it in a coastal monitoring exercise, where we basically compared uh, traditional means of data collection using smart rovers uh, over the step and the toe of a cliff, and then compared it with uh, data collected via drone. And, you know, that was probably going on five or six years ago now and even then it really showed to me how drones are going to be this um, relatively new exciting means of data collection in the survey world and if you're interested in collecting data fast efficiently with a high level of accuracy then drones are, are a really great tool to achieve that so after I left university, um, worked offshore for four years as a surveyor, got to travel the world, and then I joined COPS in 2017, as I mentioned, to, to work with people interested in this area um, of expertise and, and how we can help help you guys achieve, uh, achieve that. So these are just some of our, uh, our partners we work with, and we're solely committed to the survey industry. We, we know this is going to be a huge area of, uh, of growth. And there's more and more people along the way who is uh, starting to use drones. So first of all, our, our, our partners, LiDAR USA, great guys, been doing LiDAR from various platforms for about 20 years. Um, there's not much that these guys don't know about LiDAR and their, uh, their, their hardware and software can be equipped on things like drones or vehicles or boats or quad bikes. Pretty much as if something's moving, um, they'll have a solution to attach a LiDAR to it. And they'll have a huge range from sort of entry level Velodynes all the way up to high end Regals. So it's Pixel D, a reseller and a trainer as well. So Pixel D, I think, has become a bit of a standard in the UK, really. I mean, uh, a lot and lot of survey construction businesses are using Pixel D. And the great thing I like about Pixel D is they're always um, reinventing their, their, their softwares, new functions, new features. Um, and really catering for that ability to be able to share, capture, um, collaborate and, and use that geospatial data, not just from the survey community, community but using that data across the board, board in an organisation so other people can benefit from it as well. Um, and Pixel D support is a lot better than Benners. I, I've, I've got to agree with that one on Joe. <laughs> 100% agree with you. Also, Global Mapper, a um, really great tool for, uh, uh, it's an all-in-one GIS-based software, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later. There is a, is a tool in there as well where you can process um, uh, imagery from drones or, or, or planes and, and get the similar results as Pix4D, and they also have a LiDAR module in there as well. Phase one, um, a, uh, an airborne uh, manufacturer make, been making airborne systems by planes for a while and a couple of years ago entered that uh, UAV space with their IXM camera, which is a, you know, by far the best camera on the market, metric, built for survey and inspection. And we can talk a little bit about them as well later on. Wintra, I'm sure you've seen a uh, good few slides on these. VTOL system, uh, really great benefits. We'll touch on that as well. And if you haven't uh, heard of DJI, um, you must be under some rocks somewhere because they are huge, 80% global market share. Um, if you've not heard of them, then you've probably slipped onto this webinar by mistake or something like that. But huge organization, make really great drones um, and probably a really, you know, a spearhead manufacturer from, you know, uh, a company which started off very much in the consumable space sort of hobby drones, being on holiday with your family to take imagery and then moved into this enter enterprise, this this is um, industrial space and it really makes some great, great drones for that. So first of all, if, you, if you're if you thinking of coming to the market and using drones in your survey business or your, or, your, or your personal business, then training. We need to be qualified. We need to have that little bit of paper to say that we're allowed to um, uh, operate commercially. And at Copters, um, we can do that. 
So we are a NQE. Uh, we can provide uh, PSEO training um, and also the new regs when they come out at the end of this year. So what that normally entails with, obviously everything on, is online at the moment with the current pandemic. Um, but uh, essentially, normally it would be a two-day course with a, a, a flight test on, on the third day. But at the moment, you've got that luxury that you can do it all online. There's two ways of doing it. You can either um, go independently at your own speed, going through the modules on your own, or we do actually do uh, some live webinars as well. So you get that classroom environment um in the comfort of your own home do your ground school exam as well online um the only thing we still have to do is we start to flight test in person so that'll be at one of our training centers across the uk um what you do get of our courses is they're all, all at a level uh, four off qual uh, standard so you get a nice extra certificate with that as well and also we'll be complying and coming out with courses for these new um easa regulations uh when they come in which i'm sure you guys know have been <laughs> Delayed, delayed, delayed. So, um, yeah, 31st of December is when these will be um, coming in. So next, equipment. Well, I always think a great starting point for drones. Um, certainly people who want to dip the toe in the water and might not want to spend, you know, £10,000 at the very start. They want to just get a used to handling um, geospatial data, maybe process some information through, put it through PIX4D and see what uh, quality we can get out. I really think the Phantom 4 RTK is, 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 is great for this. Um, I've used it now for a good couple of years. We did the first case study on it um, two or three years ago, um, independently checked by a, a, a customer of ours, a survey business, and they really put it through its paces. What's really great about um, the, the, the Phantom 4 RTK is it's, it's built for survey in mind. Survey, the APCO survey was its number one um, uh, uh, things to essentially do on it so you've got the rtk module so there's a few ways you can process with this the the, the rtk was actually built um in collaboration with like geosystems um so they had a hand in that as well and there's a few ways you can get this rtk correction so you can either um uh, subscribe to a, a course correction service like like a smart net uh trimble vrs um by putting a sim card in and paying for a subscription for that and that's that's roughly sometimes on a, a low user license maybe about 1500 pound a year alternatively you can buy the base station with it and establish your an, a known point through um other survey means set that over a known point enter the coordinates in there and, and fly from that or you can post process the results um and there's a few uh, uh dji just brought out their own ppk um post-processing platform-esque um solution though one i really really recommend is one called makeitaccurate.com by far such an easy workflow um you essentially would fly your job as you normally would um and go onto the website highlight all the information from that particular folder uh, the timestamps the rynex and basically they'll charge something like $15 and that uses PPK and PPP, which is precise point positioning. And you can get um, a, 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 an accuracy of around sort of 40 to 60 mil. Um, really, really great. And I've got an example of that later. You've got your one inch uh, CMOS sensors, you've got a nice uh, footprint and it's a mechanical shutter, which we obviously like in terms of photogrammetry. So it reduces that um, that blurring we sometimes get. And it, you know, it's, it's better than using a rolling shutter. So you know, if we use a rolling shutter camera, for instance, like an X5S, we do sometimes can get this pixel blurring and we have to use a um, uh, an algorithm in Pix4D called a rolling shutter compensator to essentially squeeze that image back together and try and take some of that distortion out. So, so far, it ticks both of them boxes. We've got this RTK module on to reduce ground control points. We still want that check on the ground so we know that our our data is in the, in, in the right position and, and to a certain um degree of level of accuracy and precision which we can we can look at in in pixel d we've got that mechanical shutter and we've got that um one inch sensor as well on there also with with the phantom 4 k it's got its inbuilt uh, gsrtk app now a lot of people have always criticized dji over the, over the <laughs> over the years with their uh, flight planning software some people have some grumbles about gs pro and i can't use gs pro on a crystal sky etc um i really like gsrtk app i've never done a demonstration or work with a customer where they've said oh no i wanted it i wanted to do this and i can't do it with this i always find it covers pretty much all bases it was a bit basic at the very beginning but there's a lot more um uh, flight planning um um, um 
uh, options in there now, like linear flight paths, double grids, single grids, um, terrain following. So I, I really rate it. I really like it. Uh, this timestamp as well from so in terms of um, our imagery, it's all it's all geo referenced, and also it cuts down this time from data capture to writing that um, that timestamp on the engine. And this sometimes can be lost and introduce, uh, introduce some um, um, uh, uh, less accurate if we don't uh, get that stamp on the geotag as soon as it's been captured. You know, if you imagine uh, an, an image is captured, if you're flying along, it's captured here, but it's not um, with that coordinate and it's not right, wrote to a, a few meters away. There is that kind of small um, um, position layer into it and using uh, the time sync that's, that's combined against that. Uh, uses DJI's OcuSync um so uh, for a much more stable um secure transmission and we can use the uh the drtk base station with that so typical accuracies i'm achieving with this when when comparing it to checkpoints on the ground anywhere sort of from probably 30 40 mil in the x and y and 40 to 60 um in the z which are, which are a similar um, um accuracies we can normally uh, uh get now that's certainly not a a a, um, a point we can say that all our model is to that degree of accuracy, but it's certainly a good indication that our uh, our model is to a certain um, degree of accuracy um, on that. So this is the video I've got to show you. So I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully this will be clear enough for you guys to see. So. Mm -hmm. The dreaded share screen. There we go. So I'm just going to play this now. So I hope you can see that. Um, if you can't see it, the uh, recorded version of this will be um, uploaded as well, so you will get it more clearly. So essentially, this is this is just a, a small little uh, construction site after using the uh, Phantom 4 RTK. Um, you can see this actually was post-processed PPK. And you can see the difference here of the uh, the uh, green arrows and the blue arrows, so where it was slightly adjusted. Um, uh, with basically, we was using these as checkpoints. So there was ground control points down. We didn't use them any of the processing. There was nothing there more than a, a, a check to see the quality of the data. Um, you can see that's this is with the, the the point cloud brought now and this was flown in about i think the flight was something like eight meters uh sorry well, it was about eight minutes 60 meters flying how around a gsd of a, around a 1.8 centimeters which straight away you can see this quality of data coming through you've you've um for things like stockpile and volumetrics this is this is really great for that kind of thing but i will stress that drones aren't just a one trick pony so this is just these accuracies i'm bringing up here so you know typically sort of around that sort of 40 to 60 mil in the X and Y, and we're getting around the 50 to 60 mil in the in the Z as well. For this kind of site, that's that's kind of acceptable and what I'd expect um, when recording this. And you can see that the uh, the mesh has been uploaded now. So that's a really nice example of high quality results you can get with something like a um, a, a Phantom 4 RTK. Just coming back to the main screen now. So I do apologise, guys, that you couldn't see that. I will. Um, I will actually on the on the main one. I you will get a good, nice, clear copy of that. So I do apologise for that. But essentially, what I've shown you there is that for what the Phantom Four RTK is, which is a, uh, um, apologise, a, a a I suppose a, a good entry level uh, drone. Then uh, we can get some great results with that. So. Next of all, so I think you'll probably notice that I've gone from the Phantom 4 RTK to the wing turn. You probably think, well, there's a bit of middle ground there miss, miss, um, missing out. So there is obviously the M210 and the M300 on there as well. Now, currently, as the M300 is, um, there is uh, no survey grade payloads for that. Um, it's at the moment a, a, a really great inspection tool. Now, there will be some survey grade payloads out at the moment, but until we get that or information what they are or when they'll be out, I've decided to leave it out. M210, there are certain payloads on there which you could use for survey applications. And I know some survey companies using the X5S or the X7 on that, but I think uh, with the M210 being what it is, a really great sort of all-rounder, I've decided I'll miss it out of this one and, and, and solely concentrate on 
drones made solely for the survey industry. So you'll probably see the Winter. The Winter is a great drone and was the first um, uh, reseller to take it on board in the UK. Um, I'm sure you, some of you people have seen it in action. Um, and it, it always amazes me when it takes off. Always, always, a, always a joy and a pleasure to use. So the Wingtra, it's it's a it's a drone built for um, survey applications. Traditionally, people think thinks fixed wings are always for um, large um, uh, areas to survey. But when you have that benefit of a VTOL system, there really is no reason why you couldn't use it for small to medium sized areas. I mean, you can take off and land in very tight quarters. I mean, the the wind will take off within sort of. Uh, uh around a three meter radius of takeoff and landing area and you do still have that full control of it in the landing as well so you can make some fine adjustments as well but really what makes the wing too great is the sense that you can have this 42 megapixel sony rx camera on so ideally you know where fixed wings come in is is that mass data capture at speed flying at a very high altitude because we can put these these uh more um industrial cameras on so Typically with the wing tree, you could fly, let's say, 100 meters and get around just over a one centimeter GSD. So what that makes uh, as a business model is a very good return of investment in the sense that you can fly very high. You can still achieve very good accuracies, still get a very high, uh, sorry, very low GSD. And you can get the job done very quickly. So um, typically when you compare the wing tree with something like a Phantom 4 RTK, if you're looking at about 15 times quicker or 15 times faster in terms of data capture, but not just, you can't not necessarily just have the Sony RX42 uh, megapixel camera on it. There are other options available. So you can have the Sony QX1, uh, you can have the Micasense, either the Ultim or the Red Edge, or um, you can have a, a PPK module on that as well. And the great thing about the Wingtree is it's um, it's a modular system. So maybe you might want to start at the QX1 and over time add the PPK module or add the um, the Sony RX later on. And that can be installed yourself at home with a sense of taking out four bolts, putting the new um, fixed gimbal in and going from there. So obviously this multi-payload option. I always hear people also mention about the Wingtree, uh, that they kind of have this impression that it's... Uh, bad in the wind or very difficult to fly in the wind and i've never had any issues with it it's very similar when you compare it to other drones like the eb very similar in terms of uh, of wind resistance i think people see it as a big sail and they sort of naturally believe it to be uh, not very good in the wind but i've never had any any issues with it at all and you know up to sort of you know 18 mile an hour and it's, it's very good for a fixed wing so these are just some examples down at the bottom here in terms of what you can expect with different payloads different uh um pit with a ppk module or not and what kind of area can we cover in that time what kind of what kind of um uh, flight time that will take what sort of gsd we're achieving and there's some really great um specs to dwell on and it gives you that impression that when you are quoting for jobs you know how 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 much you're going to quote for that how long you're going to be on site how how long it's going to take with the processing and i do think there is that gap in the market with fixed wings people send, tend to sort of look at the the multi rotors first because they think well actually i can i can use that as a bit of say some fly throughs or i can use that for a bit of inspection work as well but um having a, a, a system like the winter that you've got solely for survey applications your results are really going to be brilliant from it and this is a really great example down in the bottom right here this this just comparison with the rx so the the the, the best payload you can essentially put on it compared to some of its competitors and you imagine if you were there for instance trying to pick out features like i don't know side of a curb or even picking up the center of a ground control point you've got a better chance of doing that and having a, a, a you know finding that center better with something like the um the sony R rx than you have got with um some of the other drones so great thing about with it being fixed with uh, with a vtol fixed wing is take off and landing we don't have to try and find a suitable area to to take off and land we can really do it um i mean we i on lady bower dam i landed it on the uh the front of the reservoir yeah, a bit of a hairy moment for myself but it was it was very nice and smooth and landed directly on the side there um we're not always belly landing it you know you'll see with some of the other drones that were constantly crash landing it into the ground um that caused damage that caused repairs and you can go through wings and other things um quite quite quickly so in terms of you know cost as well obviously some of the the competition 
not really a robust UAV with landing, Sean. OK, uh, I'd be interested to know what your experience are of that. We can have a chat. Um, but in my experience, I can only talk from from personal experience. Um, it's always been a very smooth landing um, and certainly with increased um, uh, uh, firmware updates. I know they did have a little issue with one firmware update when the when the landing was a bit uh, bit too quick. But like I say, on the latest one, um, I've always found it to be nice, controlled, but fast descent um, on there as well. Um, also, um, in terms of the pilot and skills, well, it's very, very automated. Um, it's um, a really great software in terms of planning. Uh, planning. So Wingtra have their own called Wingtra Pilot, um, which is very intuitive. Um, if you're used to doing uh, mission planning as well with other softwares like Pixel D Capture, then you can do it. You get you be like a duck to water, all done on a tablet. Very easy to do. You can almost do it in the field if you wish. So just on a bit of a, a comparison here, this is the difference in terms of that footprint, that how much extra data you can really capture. So we start off with the, uh, the Phantom 4 RTK um, at the beginning and work way up to the Sony RX. So really big steps there. I mean, almost double in terms of coverage. And this is all done at the um, at the same um, sort of similar altitudes to, to, to get that, uh, that same GSD across the board and if you are interested there's a really great comparison on there um of it now I'll, I'll, i'm sure you'll point out well it's from a winter website it's obviously going to be very biased I, I can hand on heart say that it's a very very good um fair analysis of the winter and um or some of their competitors across the board um, and i have tried to condense them down in here i mean certainly it's horses for courses you know we, we we try and pick the best tool for the for the job um and yes and sometimes it might not be fitting to use a a, a wing to in that particular application and we might prefer to use the, the phantom 4 rtk but i've just tried to uh, i've tried to put some some before and against here to try and give sort of a, a balanced comparison between between the two here and if uh, if anyone has any questions um on that please feel to either put your questions in the bottom um and i'll happily answer them for for you as as well so also with the with the with with the Wingtra, it is PPK, not RTK. Uh, very conscious effort. Um, the developers there did that. They wanted a didn't have to worry about necessarily sending that correction um, over to the drone. They can do it all in the post process. And so, yeah, it does take a, you know, a few minutes when you land and get back to the office to post process that data. But they 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 argue it's better than you uh, losing uh, uh, RTK lock when in flight and have to worry about um uh, reprocessing um uh, back at home or, or trying to uh, redo a flight so yeah a couple of options there and um um yeah that's a, a, just a nice quite a, quite a, a full slide but certainly brings a, the, a very fair pros and cons for for both drone data sets there um, this is it coming to land i, I imagine that uh, you guys won't be able to see that very well but um this is very high wind um at a, at a at a quarry down in St. Oster with the winch landing. Um, and I will include that as well uh, when you get a good copy if you do want to um, see that as well. So next up, uh, as mentioned before, phase one, the IXM. So um, best metric camera on the market for, um, for drones. If you're interested in highly accurate, highly detailed, large, um, medium format cameras, then there really is no competition on the market. And I know some people have said about the hassle, blood, and this new food you come out. Believe me, it doesn't touch it. Hand on heart, hand on heart does not touch this. Um, the great ability about uh, phase one is that they have got uh, two options with it. You can have a 50 megapixel and a 100 megapixel. Main difference between the two is really footprint, much larger um, uh, um, area coverage um, with it. Um, you've got this uh, high um uh frames per second uh you've got uh, its own software for sort of post processing it called capture one which is the phase one software and they'll guarantee um 500 accu accurations if i can say it properly from the camera itself and uh, phase one have said that they've had people actually um um up to a million um with it as well comes in a few options the the, the thing which um is really important about phase one is, is their lenses i mean best lenses on the market 
Um, they come in a 35 and 80 or 150 mil lens. So certainly for a, a survey uh, mapping perspective, then the 35 mil lens I'd advise. 80 sort of bit of both and inspection as well and 50 for 154 um, inspection. So it's the only... Um, uh, not too far off, Joe, on that one. Um, in terms of um, why this is a, a great camera is that you've got a big footprint, you've got it highly accurate, a lot of data captured to the highest quality. Um, they can provide you with a calibration certificate, which um, uh, no other manufacturer can provide you with. And this is really important when it comes to the processing side. A lot of people think, well, actually, the, the huge images, that'll take longer to process. Well, not necessarily because it's got a um, because these are these are calibrated. We know all this data in terms of where the principal point is on uh, on the on the on the lens and how that light when it comes through the lens is is modelled. When we put it into a software, for example, Pix4 doesn't have to keep iterating and, and working out where these unknowns are or trying to work out if that really is say a fifteen mil or or, or a thirty five mil focal length. It knows that then values be very close to the truth. So that basically saves time picks for the working through this. So uh, best, if you haven't seen any images from the phase, I strongly advise it's really, really great uh, data from it. And this is just a nice comparison with something like, say, uh, something from the DJI range, like a, an X5 with a with a, a Sony Alpha, which is very popular in terms of putting them on, for example, an M600 um, um, for sort of inspection and a bit of a um, uh, mapping as well, and, and compared to the, the phase one. So straight away we've got this high level of detail so with the phase one we can really stand very far back from our area of interest capture all that data and then we can start reviewing it and inspecting it in in the software afterwards so you might say if you've got something like a z30 or I don't know, an x5s and you was try and inspect a beam um on say this bridge you take a lot of little individual photographs um and review them afterwards or review them live. With the phase one, it really does take that strain off the pilot. You can really stand, in this case, 30 foot back, take one image of that side, and then um, you can then sort of post-process results and see them results afterwards. So less imagery is captured, and you still get an absolute uh, high quality um, uh, GSD uh, from that. So if you look on the next chart, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, here so this is just a nice sort of a, in terms of um the, the results from it uh, when we're post processing them as well so we've got this uh this 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 graph here so this does have quite a few cameras on as well um it goes through everything in terms of this was used in a, an inspection slash uh modeling application and i think the things the main things to point out here was this um uh so we've got the two ixms we've got the 50 um so we've got the, the 100 i imagine one of these would be the 50 ones as well and also a, a bunch of other cameras which are quite typical people are using for inspection survey and straight away the the, the ixm comes up on top with in terms of less images captured so straight away in terms of processing time we don't have to handle mass data sets it's a lot more manageable uh we can fly further away so sort of 50 meters on that one um large amount of image image coverage and less flight lines in terms of um actually doing say a waypoint emission on that so works out to be a, a hell of a lot more efficient than some of its competitors as well so i think naturally yes people look at it like joe joe pointed out that's a, it's a lot of money for a camera but when you do the numbers on it and work out the return of investment it actually makes it um very good for an accountant or business partners to actually um get behind and see them benefits um from using such a, a high-end powerful camera um for it and, and again we did a uh if, you, if anybody is interested about the phase one we did a, a joint webinar at the i think the start of last month where uh we had one of the phase one reps um discuss and go through um all these parameters on why investing in a camera like this is is is, is very beneficial and the numbers really do speak loudly not just in terms of that highly accurate survey side, but the business side of it as well. Um, and I'd, certainly I'll put that link at the bottom there if anyone does want to give it a watch. So LiDAR. So LiDAR is something which we get asked about quite a lot of copters. There's always a, a, a buzz surrounding LiDAR. Um, and with our partners at LiDAR, LiDAR USA, we can provide a lot of different packages, something like the, uh, the M8 laser there on the M210, um, uh, up to sort of larger Velodynes, the H32s, and up to the Regal range. Now, 
LIDAR's, LIDAR's very good for certain applications. I mean, this ability to be able to um, punch through vegetation, um, you don't have to obviously worry about an overlap to create that stereoscope in terms of photogrammetry. So we can run a, a, a very low overlap just to make sure that we don't miss any data. And the processing side tends to be a lot quicker as well um, in terms of producing that point cloud. Um, applications in things like uh, forest canopy analysis, uh, and, uh, you can imagine using it on a railway for um, encroachment surveys, that kind of thing. So there's definitely a market for LIDAR. We do get asked about it quite a lot. As I'm sure you uh, um, you appreciate, um, it does come at a cost and a premium for that. Um, but you can equip them essentially with anything. And the good thing about the systems we provide at LIDAR USA is essentially that you can, not necessarily on the M210 ones, that's very much a, a bespoke system built for the M210, but things like the M8 systems here, which can go on the M600 in the center, and the larger uh, H32s and the Regals here, they can go on the drone and within couple of minutes you can detach this on a quick release pin and for example put it back put it on the back of a vehicle or put it on a quad bike using uh, one of the mounts LADA USA uh, uses or even a backpack so essentially for a, um, one cost you've got then multiple data collection methods so it's like a three-in-one system so on a drone on a backpack or on a vehicle which again that return of investment straight away there and you can merge all them data sets together so um, yeah uh, Really big fan of LIDAR, and certainly LIDAR USA's products re really great in that respect. Now, I do have some data I can show you from uh, the LIDARs. So I'll just um, do a project if you can't see this, but I will try again for you. So hopefully, I'm hoping you can see that. Oh, so this is just from um, a on rail, um, and this is for um, I believe encroachment and basically taking um, uh, boots off ballast. And they just wanted to do this in terms of earthwork modelling. So again, this was a this was probably a four or five minute flight. Uh, one run up, one run back down again, and you can start seeing we're starting to get this data from underneath the canopy, um, underneath these trees here. Um, and that's that's port, that's um, a LIDAR data set in its raw form. Now, I would stress with LIDAR, there's a little bit of cleaning we have to do with it. Sometimes it can be slightly noisy. And um, certainly in terms of this sort of vegetation um, around the side here, you've got to imagine that, like when we talk about um, uh, photogrammetry, um, um, like we talk about photogrammetry, um, we have this thing about, well, we can't pick up vegetation. So is it the... Uh, we're up the top, we're being up the bottom. So with LIDAR, we'll, we'll collect it all. So we'll collect the top of the vegetation at the bottom. So we will have to do, I don't know, like a lowest point algorithm or, or, or do, do an average between the two to try and produce a, a true ground level. It's, it's not a case of just being able to get that bottom level. There is a certain degree of data interrogation and data analysis we have to do. And that's why we, we like to use Global Mapper for that, because there is a dedicated LIDAR module um, in that, which we can um, we can uh, extract them features we need. So software, so software is one of the things where um, all that data we've captured, how do we produce it in a, in a meaningful form to either do any further analysis or, um, or or hand over to the client? So we did we did two at COPS in terms of this survey space we're working in. So I say PIX4D. Um, very much become, a, I suppose, a standard in the UK to a certain degree. Um, certainly, people have heard of it, or they've heard say have heard of Pixel D Capture, or this, or they've had a play with it as well. I do think Pixel D is certainly very easy to use. It's very intuitive. They've got a good support webinars. They've got good support. Um, we can provide that all ourselves, and that's certainly what we do as as a business. We we kind of uh, work with you from uh, the very start all the way to the very end, adding that support. Uh, you know, if you've got issues with the process side, then you know I myself can jump on online and, and and have have a look at it for you as well. But very easy to do. And I say most most of the time, people are still using Pix4D for what it's really good at, and that's processing imagery, getting it into a survey grade uh, deliverable and format, which we can then use for further analysis. Now, most of my customers they will take that data out of Pix4D 
and they'll use it and put in something like Enforce or S, uh, SCC or LSS to do that sort of final stage of the computations. In terms of Pix4D Mapper, um, you know, volumetrics we can do on the cloud base. We can do things like cross sections that. But I think for certainly survey personnel, I've already spent that time and money on um, a survey software, which they know off the back of their hands. For me, that makes sense to use, use Pix4D, what it's good at, and get that data out and put it into another software if you do want to do any further analysis. And we do all, we provide all the training with Pix4D and the support as well to go with it. Um, Global Mapper, um, great software, like I say, for, for LiDAR or turning point cloud data sets um, into raster formats and actually extracting features and doing um, any further analysis. They have flood monitoring algorithms on there. Um, you can pull cross sections through, you can clean LiDAR data or point cloud data sets data set, so essentially creating a, um, a DTM from a DEM, DEM, so you can start removing uh, trees, woodland, that kind of thing, very quickly and efficiently. And if, if you if you haven't had a go at Global Mapper, I, I would definitely recommend it. Really good and a, a relatively um, inexpensive software. I mean, for the year, you can purchase it for about um, $1,000 from ourselves or something like that, um, and that's included the LiDAR module um, as well. So two softwares there, both for the survey slash drone industry, um, which which uh, we provide all the support for. Um, if you need any help with Pixel D, just want to discuss some of the other options with Pixel D, like they do um, a cloud package, they have a, a, a BIM package as well, then I can I can happily talk through some of the advantages and disadvantages of certain applications. And they mostly come in differences in price, but we can we can work out the best option um, for yourselves on that. So something which we are doing, so we do do things like uh, packages with the whole support and the training to go with it. And this is a typical one at the moment. We're running with the Phantom 4 RTK uh, with extra batteries, Pixel D Mapper. You'll have a 30 minute online session with myself to go through things like how to collect the good quality uh, data, how to process it as well. Um, and also, um, I can you can use draw my experience in the survey world as well, so that you get the most out of it. Thing about drones, we want to see people using them in the industry. We want to see you going out to customers and clients and using it um, uh, in uh, uh, within your workflow. Now, there's two sides of a, of a, of, uh, of drones in a in a survey based business. Now, I often say I've heard people say, "Yeah, but I, if you are a surveyor, I often people say, "Yeah, but I don't get many I don't get any requests for someone saying." Um, um, I want you to come and do a, a drone survey, John, or whatever. It's like, well, I don't think you will necessarily all the time, uh, certainly at the beginning. You know, this is a tool for yourselves to use as and when required. So two strands of businesses. One, yes, you might get someone call up and saying, yes, can you use, I want you to come and do a drone survey. The second side of it is you might get a scope of work coming and you say, actually, the best tool for that job to use is a drone. So that will make you more profitable so you can use the drone on that job because um, you see it fit. It's, I always use the, a bit of an analogy in the sense of if you employed a joiner to come around to your house and build you a set of lovely wardrobes, you're not at him going, what hammer are you using? What saw are you going to use on that? You leave him to get on with the job in hand to use the, the tools he knows best and what he knows to use. To be to produce the best product, and that's the same with using drones. When a job comes in, it's up to us to decide. Actually, the drone's the best tool for that job, and that's why I think some people kind of get this bit of impression that people are going to be calling you for for uh, drone work. Which yes, will will happen, but where we can be more profitable and really get the most benefits out of using drones is deciding to use a drone on a particular job where the client uh, might not necessarily know or fully understand. Because at the end of the day, if he was fully aware of drones and survey, he'd do the job himself. Um, so that's where I think I think really we, we can get great benefits from it. And I know a lot of survey companies doing this now. They're just using the drones on jobs and and uh, um, instead of necessarily seeking permission to. I always think that's the best way to do it. Um, so yeah, that's that's the offer we run at the moment. And uh, if you want to chat about that, then by all means get in touch with myself. So right, the Q and A's at the very end. Um, so Mark, do you need any previous experience? So um, it's always a good thing to have a, some prerequisite knowledge in a in a um, an industry. Um, I do know people operating in the survey space because they've done that self discipline, they've done that self learning. They might have gone onto a course or. They might have teamed up with a survey business and done a bit of a, a, a skill swap 
almost, which 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 does happen. There is some really good um, uh, partnerships in place where a survey company will use um, a drone operator um, to do that, and the, the survey business will sort of teach a little bit of the survey side and vice versa. That happens as well, but there's, there's so much great online content out there about using drones in surveying. I did a, a masterclass uh, a couple of months ago, um, which was sort of three hours long about drones. It goes into the theory side of it, how to collect good quality data. So um, I, I always think it's one of these things where if you want to do something like survey, it's not to be something to take in lightly, but can be done if you've got that, that discipline. If you think about it, back in the day before I went to university, I knew no knowledge of this, uh, but I spent time to educate myself and learn it. And that's no different to anybody else who wants to enter a market or enter industry. It's all about that self-discipline and all about that, that learning. Because at the end of the day, if you're approaching clients, you're going to want to be able to talk the lingo. Or you're going to want to be understand what they're trying to achieve. And if you do that discipline and that learning, then then you, you can sell yourself and that they think, well, actually, yeah, Mark, you, you, you know what you're talking about. Hey, I, I'm going to employ you to do um, the services. I hope that's answered your question, Mark. I would like to start to practice on 3D uh, point cloud and seamless ortho imagery. I have a Mavic 2 Pro. I really appreciate a guide on which software in each step. Well, um, so the Mavic 2 Pro, I do know people, some use this for some survey applications. I, I wouldn't recommend it for doing any high-end survey work, um, but some people are using it. But certainly it will give you a feel of using drones and capturing, capturing data uh, for this. Um, I mean, flight planning softwares, I mean, there's so many on the market. I mean, Pix4D have their own called Capture, which is Android and, and iOS based. Um, uh, image processing software, I mean, Pix4D and Global Mapper, definitely a good place to start. Um, and that will produce your, your point cloud as well. Uh, and lastly, to store and share data, which software is compatible? So Pix4D does have a cloud-based um, option, so you can process on the desktop, and if you wish, upload that data to the cloud, which is really useful if you want to share that data with a client or um, share it with colleagues. As, as, as you probably know, data sets can be very big and heavy, and how we transport that and share that with um, with, with clients can be difficult. Pix4D cloud does answer that and 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 um, sort out that sorts out that solution for you. So I hope that's answered your question, Usman. Uh, going down, Carl. How do you cost survey work? Is there a, a specific price standard? So there's a couple of ways I've seen people do it. They either charge by say the hectare, or they might do a, a, a day rate. Now I would always say you're best off going down the traditional airborne route of, of charging it by by hectare um that's from, from my and i see for you guys to be able to be the most profitable um it comes down to with equipment as well um you couldn't come you couldn't charge or command the same price as say somebody with a phase one ixm if you have a mavic pro it, it doesn't work like that what what i suppose determines your price would be experience your um uh, hardware um, and what you're going to produce at the end of it. If you're just going to be date capturing data, then supplying that data to say a survey business will process it, then um, obviously you can't charge as much if you was going to do the full workflow from time. So a few things, experience, hardware, what software you've got. And, and I think importantly, what the client wants at the end of the day, um, you might see something like you know a point cloud um, and it looks very visually pleasing, but that's very much the kind of the start of the work. Somebody somewhere down the, the, the line will use that data for further analysis or type, take cross sections out of it or something like that to do further work on. So just kind of I, I'd educate a little bit more in terms of what you want to achieve and what you want, what, what you want to give to your client um, um, to work out sort of a good um, uh, um, price on that. Any insight on DJI release? Uh, no insight at the moment. I just know that they are um, on that one. Is the Mavic Zoom or the Inspire 2 a good server drone? So this is this is a good example of, uh, of you, you comparing a drone, Inspire 2, to a Mavic with a fixed camera. Now, why I say that is, is the thing we're most interested in, in the survey world is sensor. The drone is nothing more than a donkey, a workhorse, something we're going to attach a good quality sensor to to get a good survey grade result at the end of it so in terms of say the inspires inspires really good um platform uh, what i would say to that is what what camera we're going to put on it so i do know some survey companies they'd put like a, 
an X5S on it, but we'd have to work, obviously, remember about the rolling shutter or a, an X7 on there. So that does have a mechanical shutter. Thing about the Mavic Zoom is it's not a fixed focal length. So straight away, we're going to be losing uh, some survey grade, uh, survey accuracy because that camera is going to be moving when you're zooming it um, in and out. So I wouldn't recommend the Mavic Zoom, certainly for survey applications. At the absolute very, very minimum, I would say the Pro, but as sort of previously mentioned, I wouldn't necessarily uh, recommend that, certainly for any high-end survey works um, at all. As I say, which LiDAR or camera can be mounted on the M300? Uh, not any which I know of. I do know there's a couple of companies um, floating about doing the M300. The difficulty, even though the M300, don't get me wrong, is a really, really great drone, I still feel that if you're equipped in, let's say, a 45 grand sensor, LiDAR sensor onto a drone, you're going to want that bit of redundancy in place. Now, for me, it's been out for a few years now, but still the M600 Pro for me is still a really great workhorse to put on, put a LiDAR on, put on a, a phase one camera, just because you've got that added redundancy with the props. You've got the A3 triple redundant system on there and you've got a really good flight time. I mean, we put the Regal Vux system on it. Um, probably this time last year, which is a quite a heavy LiDAR system, probably looks about four and a half K uh, G. And we we got about 24 minutes flight time out of it, which which is very impressive for, for that particular drone. And you got to realize 24 minutes flying, a lot of data to capture, process and interrogate. But especially, uh, what about specializing just roof surveying uh, to start with? Can this business to start with the experience? Um, uh, potentially, yeah, Paul. Um, there's a good software. I don't know if you was on the uh, the webinar this morning and I did with uh, my colleague George. From an inspection point of view, sort of, uh, I imagine you're looking at it from inspecting, taking imagery, and then being able to annotate on top of that. Um, I know Haley's on the uh, on the, uh, my colleague on on the chat at the moment. Um, it might be worth um, watching the webinar we did this morning. So that's very much focused at um, a software called Ava, which is a software for um, uploading your data to and then being able to annotate on that. So in your example, like roof surveying, you can use a, a predetermined flight path to, to capture that data on, say, a roof, upload the data to Ava. So that position all that imagery on top of, as I say, a, a Bing overlay. So you can see where those images were taken. You can see um, the orientation of them, but you can click on them individual images and start annotating on top of it. So you could, for example, set up a template, go over um, the imagery. Thanks, Haley. Just put the link up there and essentially annotate. So you could find, for example, a slip roof tile, highlight that, add a severity rating, add some remediation action. And then in about two or three clicks, you can run off a full PDF report of all that imagery captured, all nicely uh, put together in its severity rating, what work needs to be done to it. And then that can be either handed over to a client or if you have got a, a facility management business, handing that over to one of your workers and he can go to a site, find exactly where this fault is and what needs to be done as well. So it's sort of start of a work pack as well. Um, really great. If you do want to watch it, Haley's just dropped the link into the chat. Uh, and 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 we can have a chat about it uh, later as well. So I hope that's answered your question, uh, Paul. Mike, do you think surveying is a viable option for a one-man band, two-man uh, operation? Uh, abs abs absolutely. Um, um, I still know big, larger um, construction companies still using um, subcontractors. Less risk for them. They can get you, Mike, to, to come on over with a drone, collect the data, jobs are good. And that, that, that's exactly it. Um, I think in terms of uh, people who we've sold to before, I mean, individual site engineers, survey business, which which is, a you know, essentially a, a one man band or a, a self-employed person. And, you know, using drones and adding it to what they're already doing for sort of a survey application, really great benefits that and, and definitely work out there for for yourself um, in that. Can you add an aftermarket RTK module uh, to a Phantom 4 Pro cost versus buying the new Phantom 4 RTK? Um, so, yeah, Craig, I'm sure you've seen um, that is an option. The only thing I think is when you start adding extra sensors, which are not factory um, approved or factory installed straight away, then you kind of could potentially be invalidating your warranty. And you can you can almost imagine if you did crash and you, you, you sent it in a repair, they would say, would, would you, are you using anything which is aftermarket? So you're probably, um, I would stay away from it. In terms of cost, you're probably looking very similar. 
and the workflow is slightly adapted and then you'll be using tapping into a different sensor to set the ball rolling what's easier than getting a phantom 4 rtk out of the box turning it on nice straight easy workflow connect to a course correction service or your base station and press and go easy as that that that's why i think it's worth i think into i think i did look a couple of years ago when these first third market third party sensors started coming out i think in terms of maybe the sake of maybe five six hundred pounds um uh it's, it's worth um just spending that extra and actually having a refined workflow and also then with uk support we can support the rtk phantom 4 um uh, myself and from our office uh phase one ixm can it be mounted on the m210 uh no uh potentially on the m300 um they're working on it <laughs> i know that for sure they're working on it can these drones for surveying and mapping also be used for pho uh, photography film um or are they two sections of food so with the phantom forward to care as i mentioned before um it's it's built for survey in mind but you can take stills you can take videos of it some of the fit the features and the functionality from something let's say the phantom 4 pro where you've got some of the intelligent flights or certainly on the mavic you have they aren't available on the phantom 4 rtk um but if you was say on a construction site doing a survey and you wanted to take some stills or video yes you can do that is that the a2fc with the pfco is or is this the one or the other so um how we're operating at the moment if you do want to get involved with the pifco as you might have understood there's a lot of um uh, delays what sort of rules are we going to introduce are we going to uh, adopt the whole of the essay regulations or cherry pick them so what we're saying now at the moment is or for me personally it's better the devil we know the pfco is not going to expire at the end of december there's going to be a couple of years we can still operate on that and and also you can essentially have a pfco as well as an a2 of c certificate because they're both different um arbitrary uh, um, uh, bodies um who issue them so what you can get with our pfco courses is you get a free transfer over to the a2 of c so you can sit on the pifco get that for 12 months then make that decision let's say next year do you want to enroll on the a2 of c yet or do you want to renew your pfco for another 12 months you will obviously in time you won't be able to renew it after uh, a couple of years but then you can make that decision actually well now i can just going to go on to the a2 of c so better the dev you know um, i know still a lot of people who, who like the pfco rules and, and have been operating to them for the past couple of years um so why not also i know uh people are, are, are doing the um the combination so certain scopes of work they might adopt the pfco rules and on the other ones um uh using say the a2 or c or, or uh, uh, uh the, the the gvc side of things so i hope that's uh answered your question sean uh, does copters offer any hand training courses for pix 4 d we do uh, there will be an online drone surveying course um which is interactive it's about 11 modules um um I've done it's really good. I found it very informative. That should be coming online in the next couple of weeks. Um, it's about 11 or 10 hours of study with interactive videos and you get a certificate at the end saying that you completed it. We will be going back at some point face-to-face um, -face learning with PIX4D. Just at the moment with the, the pandemic, that's been difficult to us uh, to do, but that will be something we will, we will be addressing again in the future. Damien, just purchased the Mavic 2 Pro uh, drone. Is Pixel D Mapper the software to use this data? Absolutely. So Pixel D Mapper, as long as your data is uh, well, made easy, if it's geotagged, um, you can use that data in there, no, no problem at all, and, and start getting that feel for geospatial geospatial data. Um, so yeah, as long as as long as it's in uh, the JPEG, as long as you can upload it up to Pixel D with geotags, you can start having a go at processing and getting point clouds or through images out. Paul, what's the best value for money drone for uh, roost frame? Well, roost frame is one interesting. Thing. If you're just doing, say, a residential build and a house, or maybe a, a small industrial unit, then yeah, the the, fan, uh, the, the Mavic uh, Pro would be a great little drone for that, just to get high resolution imagery, fast, efficiently, drone out the pocket. Why not? That works for that. We don't want to overkill stuff. We'd rather, you know, that sometimes there's no point getting an M210 or an M300 out of the box uh, if you're just wanting to be fine up to, say, a chimney stack on a residential area. Overkill. I sort of mentioned at the start, horses for courses. It's just another tool, different tools 
uh, different drones are better in different applications than others. If you are just doing, say, a residential chimney stack, do you really want to get an M600 Pro out of a phase one camera out? I'd argue not. Um, so a little Mavic Pro in that application would work would work absolutely fine. John Clark, I'm currently using a Fantafar RTK, um, although I'm a new user and still getting to grips with it. I'm currently experience, experimenting using Autodesk, product called Recap, yeah, we use Recap to allow me to convert data into point cloud, which can be used in Revit or, or three, uh, civils 3d to create models I work, I work as a designer in civils and construction and this looking promising for getting data into a modeling program just for i'd share an alternative route for using that yeah absolutely jonathan yes so as i said um pixel d is is a stepping stone and as jonathan sort of pointed out there it's what you do with that data afterwards so putting it into civils 3d or putting it into cad or lss um really gets that uh, you really get that benefit um out of it is it's it's a starting point Collecting drone data and processing and picks is that starting point. There will be somewhere, someone else down the way who'll be using that data or doing further analysis. Uh, Usman, again, if you install Pixel D on your mobile for flight planning purposes, would you still need Leachy or... Uh, no, one flight planning software is, is, is all. If you are interested in a really good flight planning software, I've mentioned it on previous webinars, one called Hammer. It's only available on iOS devices, but in that app, You'll never want another flight plan app again. It will do uh, facade inspections, uh, facade mapping, the full shebang. You can upload models onto it or use their data. It, it's brilliant. Hammer, I think it's called Hammer Missions. Type that in on, on, on Google and it'll be great. Uh, really great uh, flight planning software. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Best drone for oh, to answer that one above. Gareth Wilson, would you recommend the M600 or the M300 or for wind turbine blade inspection? So, sorry. Good question, Gareth. We'll probably should talk a little bit more. It depends again on sensor. Uh, M600 is really great for putting custom cameras on. So things like the phase one, or we do an integration with the Sony AR7 where you can get direct geotagging from it on a Gremsey gimbal. That's great, really good. We can do that for you, no issues. Or the M300, if you want to. The great thing about the M300 is, um, is we always know DJI do great drones, but their new sensors on there are fantastic. Um, you've got your laser range finder, you've got a wide angle 12 megapixel camera, as well as a 20 megapixel optical zoom camera as well. So essentially one flight, multiple data sets, and also the flight planning functionality and that taking the stress out of a pilot on the ground so you can return back to a pylon which you visited maybe two or three months ago and send the drone up and go to that exact same position again so um we should talk gareth but um it's a toss up really I'd, it's, it's difficult really but um we'll see maybe m300 just for that ease of use plug and play dji which they're really great at doing um any more questions i didn't think i was going to talk for an hour but don't time fly eh so thanks everybody for listening I think I've answered all your questions, but if not, please get in touch um, at the end. I'll drop my email uh, in the chat screen and my mobile phone number as well. If you want any questions, you want to just discuss any options of yourself, have a bit more about chat about it, please get in contact with myself. Um, I will call that quits now. Uh, we do offer finance packages and we do offer leasing as well on our products. So thanks very much for listening, everybody. Um, great to see you all here again. Some uh, some usual faces we always see. So great to catch up with, you, with yourselves again. Um, get in contact and I'll happily chat any, any further more about um, anything we can offer you guys. So thanks very much for listening and I will see you again very soon.